Hello, Duke fans, and welcome to episode 307 of the Duke Basketball Report podcast. It is still Wednesday, April 14th, 2021. We know you just heard from us earlier today, but we are back a few hours after the David Rubenstein interview to bring you an emergency episode on some major news that just dropped. Donald here, I'm hosting this episode, and Sam and Jason are here with me. Gentlemen, since we just spoke this morning, let's just jump into the big news of the day. We learned a little more than an hour ago that Duke forward Matthew Hurt has declared for the NBA draft. The sophomore was one of the best players in the ACC this season, Duke's best player of the year. He was also first team ACC and the ACC's most improved player this season. But he takes his 18.3 points per game and 6.2 rebounds per game to the NBA. He will sign with an agent, which will end his college eligibility. And he joins Jalen Johnson and DJ Stewart as Duke players who have declared for the draft. So Sam, hello, I will bring you in first. If you go back to late last summer, we heard from Matthew Hurt's dad that Matt had worked on his game and his frame. He had the Juicy Lucy diet going. He put up 50,000 shots over the summer, and you could see the improvement in his game all year. So give us your thoughts on Matthew Hurt declaring for the NBA draft. I don't know how many times we said it on the show this year, but Few Duke players, I think, we have seen in, at least in in my memory, that have improved as much from freshman to sophomore year as Matthew Hurt. I I think we've seen guys make big leaps at at various points in their careers, but freshman year, Matthew Hurt was a bench player, not a guy that that Duke was relying on for much. And when he came, and and there was sort of not a, there wasn't a question about whether he was going to come back for his sophomore year. His sophomore season was, was outstanding points, rebounds passing, uh, even getting a little bit better at defense, although I'm sure we're going to talk about how he needs to work on that. But I am astounded at how he basically said at the beginning of the summer, this is what I'm going to do. And he absolutely did it. He followed through. And I, and I think that he surprised Duke fans and and college basketball media on just how how well improved he was this season. The Duke player that I'm thinking of in recent memory that may have something of a a similar trajectory, although I don't think his leap sophomore year was quite as big as Luke Kennard. Luke Kennard, also more of a guard than a forward. And and Matthew Hurt is a, you know, is, is certainly a power forward. Maybe in the NBA, he has to play small forward, but I think he is going to be most successful if he is able to bulk up to the point where he can play power forward. Luke Kennard's another guy who came back sophomore year and was just dazzling on offense in, in, in a somewhat different way than Matthew Hurt was, but basically forced himself out and, and into the NBA draft by how well he performed. I would love to have to see Matthew Hurt perform as well as Luke Kennard has so far in his NBA career has become a, you know, not a, not a superstar by any means, but a, a solid NBA regular. So I think that's, it, it's not a perfect comp and, and I'm certainly falling victim to white guy, like white guy, but uh, I, I think it's a, I think it's a, a nice blueprint for Matthew Hurt. Yeah, I agree. And and Jason, I'll bring you also in. In recent days, we had heard rumblings that Matt had been seriously considering coming back to Duke for his junior year. We had talked about it on this show a couple of times. In the end, he opts to do what I think deep down we all expected he would do and go to the NBA. So, what are you thinking of just you know that and also Matthew Hurt's time in a Duke uniform? He had a lot of standout moments. Is there any that really stand out to you? I think we've made points that Louisville game, of course, where he dropped 37. Uh, yeah. Look, Sam touched on this. The most important award, the most important thing you can say about Matthew Hurt is that he was the ACC's most improved player from his freshman to sophomore year. Um, Donald, you started us off by talking about the fact that his father talked about, you know, putting up 50,000 shots and and uh, putting on weight. And by the way, we, we joke about putting on weight by the Juicy Lucy and, and eating foods and such. That, that's not actually how you, you, know, you put on the right kind of weight. You put on weight by working out. You put on weight, yes, by consuming extra calories, but also by turning those calories into muscle. And, and that's what Matthew Hurt did in the off season. There are a lot of people who, and, and we're going to get into more of his NBA stock. There are a lot of people who are going to say that Matthew Hurt you know, may have trouble at the next level. Um, and uh, you know, I, I, I'm of the belief that Matthew Hurt's going to be quite successful in the NBA, and that's because he has shown he is the kind of guy who is willing to put in the work to get better. His freshman year at Duke was disappointing. This is a guy who was a top ten recruit. There are not a lot of top ten recruits who weren't injured. Look, you know, let's take Harry Giles and people like that out of the equation. Top ten recruits who were not injured 
who had seasons that were as disappointing as Matthew Hurt. It's a very, very short list. And I, I haven't gone back to look through it, but not a lot of names on that list. For Matthew Hurt to, to take the disappointment, because his freshman year was a disappointment, to take that disappointment and channel it into becoming the player he became as a sophomore, arguably, I think, the best offensive player in the ACC. For him to do that, boy, tip of the cap to him, and, and you have to admire that kind of, of perseverance and that kind of willpower. Matthew Hurt, according to Ken Pomeroy, was the 14th best offensive player in all of college basketball. I want you to think about that for a minute. I mean, that is truly impressive. The 14th best offensive rating in all of college basketball, according to computers, according to Ken Palm. And that's on a team where he's playing with a bunch of young players. He was suddenly, you know, one of the most experienced guys on the floor playing with younger players, a team where opponents are keying on him all the time. He did not have a lot of other guys to, you know, that he could count on to be big offensive performers. And I, I was just, it, it was an incredibly impressive season. He was able to score in a million different ways. And the people who think he's not going to be able to do that at the next level are wrong, in my opinion. They are wrong. Yeah. And Jason, when it comes to Matthew Hurt, I think you both touched on you know, a lot of what I was going to say about him improving, him being a guy who can learn what he did wrong or, or you know, could improve on from his freshman year and work hard at doing that better his sophomore year. And he's clearly a guy who can be coached up. He's clearly a guy who's going to put in the hours. He's going to put in the jump shots. Uh, late at night to to get his frame ready for the NBA and get his game ready for the NBA. But for me, it's how lethal he was at times. There were times where, I mean, in, in a, first of all, in a year that's cons- uh, that we lack consistency, we knew Matthew Hurt was going to be our leading scorer from the opening practice. That's what we were hearing. That's what happened. He also was a guy that took everyone's best shot. We knew, you know, other teams knew he was going to be a one and they still went after him. And time and time again, he delivered with uh, on the on the offensive end, especially, but even sometimes on the defensive end. And when you are trying to look at his his ability going forward, I know we'll we'll kind of talk more specifically about his like stock and where he might end up. But one of the things that I love about Matthew Hurt, this is a quality that I think applies more in football, where guys have to physically mature a little bit to actually be considered pros or, or to go into the pro, into the pros is like their is their projectability, I think is the the term that NFL and, and college football scouts use. Great projectability on Matthew Hurt, where as Jason said, he was able to do all that development. And when you look at him now on the basketball court, it's not like he's huge and cut, right? He is still like kind of baby faced and and has the ability to put on, I think, more weight and and get it to a point where he is really strong. And if he's really strong and has a release that is as quick as it is, man, that guy could could stick around in the NBA for a long time. Yeah, his release in, increased just the quickness of it. We talked about how that was a thing that even back in high school when he committed, we're like, he's got to work on that. And if he can get that shut off quickly, it'll be great. But really, Not just quick when it comes high. to the the, yeah. the height of his release to me is is the thing that makes him so difficult to guard and allows him to get off those shots. Um, and that's the really impressive thing. And, and as much as you focus on his three-point shot, and he, look, the guy hit 44, 45% of his threes. That's a huge number. He's a great three-point shooter. I was more impressed with what he was able to do in the half court, taking two-point shots, using the back, uh, you know, using the bank, um, the backboard, and, and, and his ability to get off that that you know that shot like on one foot people compared him to Larry Bird so much absurd comparison please do not do it but on the other hand <laughs> it it his, they, his shot kind of looked like that but here's yeah. the thing about it here's the thing about it it's not even that he was good at it it's that there was a point at every it, in every game where he did that step back one leg fadeaway jumper off of one foot and you knew it was going in like it was just water every single time. And there were games where he would show up and even in when everything else around him was very inconsistent, he would deliver every single time. And, and there'd be times where, you know, we'd be yelling at the TV, the ball needs to be in his hands because whenever he shot it, you knew it was going in and you knew that it was with the ball in his hands that we had a chance to win every ball game. And I know that we've talked about this on prior episodes when it comes to thinking about the roster for next year, but had Matthew Hurt decided to come back to Duke next season, it would have been tough for him to have the kind of space to make offensive plays, especially in the paint. You would have seen, and and we will see, and we'll talk a lot about 
not only Mark Williams getting more playing time and more attention on the offensive end, but Paulo Bancaro stepping into the power forward role. I think that that Paulo and, and Matt Hurt could have figured out how to play together, but it would have been there would have been a limited amount of space for Hurt to really showcase that mid range game that he got so good at this season. I feel like if both guys were on the team, Coach K would have figured it out. You you have two great talents in Matt Hurd and Paulo Boncaro. And even when you throw in Matt, you know, Mark Williams into the equation, he would have figured something out. But yeah, I think now that that is that that's no longer the case, we'll have guys that have their minutes and have their spacing and, and our team is going to look uh, a little bit different. But what I want to do right now, I want to talk about Matthew Hurd's professional future, where he could fit in the NBA and how his career is projected to go. But let's pause quickly, collect our thoughts. I know this just happened. So on the other side, more about the departure of Matthew Hurt from Duke. Okay, we are back. We are discussing Matthew Hurt declaring for the NBA draft just a little bit over an hour ago. I wanted to talk about what the draft boards are saying about Matthew Hurt and where he could go in the NBA draft because it, we, we've seen him play and the draft boards right now aren't looking like they are too high on Matthew Hurt, but we'll talk about it. Jason, I go back to you. What are you seeing about where Matt Hurt could fall in the draft and the prospects of him having a great career in the NBA? I think we all think, you know, the three of us think that he can carve out a nice career, but what are you, what are you seeing? Most of the you know NBA draft prognosticators, the mock drafts and the such, seem to have Matthew Hurt like around the middle to the back half of the second round. Um, I've seen you know lots of stuff having him like in the 40s or so, maybe in the 50s, probably getting drafted. Look, anytime you're talking about someone who's not a surefire first rounder, there's a chance they go they go undrafted. I'm not going to say it's a guarantee that Matthew Hurt gets drafted, but I think it's pretty likely that he does. Um, And and I'll predict this when you're watching the NBA draft show, Jay Billis will probably be a commentator on it. He almost always is when they call Matthew Hurt's name. And and I I think they'll call it somewhere in the forties. Jay Billis will say that he is, uh, that his shot is NBA ready. And, and, And there's little question that Matthew Hurt has the offensive skills, the shooting skills to be able to contribute to an NBA team right away. The problem for Matthew Hurt is that there are two ends of the floor. <laughs> and uh, and I think from a physical standpoint, uh, and by that, I, I, I don't just mean his strength. I also mean his, his quickness, his lateral quickness, especially. Matthew Hurt's going to struggle um, defending guys in the NBA. Uh, it, he, he's not someone who excelled at that in college. And in the NBA, they are way, way better <laughs> than they are in college. So, they're bigger and they're faster and Matthew Hurt's going to have to learn how to keep up with them and and how much he is able to improve his his quickness and his strength is going to determine whether he spends more of his time in the NBA or in the G League for his first you know 2 years that he's with an organization. I think the organization that takes him is well aware of that and knows that he's got as you said that one NBA ready skill which by the way is pretty much all NBA teams are looking for from a second rounder. I mean even mid to late first round, you're only drafting for one skill. You're drafting for shooting. You're drafting for passing. You're drafting for on-ball defense. That's that's all you need to get on the court in the NBA. But for Matt Hurt to succeed, he's got to be quicker so that he doesn't have to be taken out of the game on defense. I'd say the other thing, the other trait that they're looking for is coachability. And he has that coachability. He And you know a guy's going to work hard. We just talked about that. He's going to be, be able to work hard. He's going to be able to put those shots in the gym. And he's going to be a guy who's going to be a sponge when it comes to taking. And I know Coach K will help in that draft process of saying like, hey, if you want a guy who's going to listen to everything you say and actually get better, look no further than the most improved player of the year. Yeah, and I'll tell you the other thing about Matthew Hurt that people didn't really notice that much. He was really good at not turning the ball over, at not making mistakes. He didn't take bad shots. He didn't, like I say, he didn't turn the ball over much at all. He he actually led Duke. He was Duke's best player in terms of turnover rate. And by best, I don't mean highest, I mean lowest. <laughs> uh, his turnover rate was better than, than any of the other regulars on the Duke team. I think that's, again, another thing NBA teams are going to value. You, got, you talked about the coachability, willingness to put in the hard work. And, and like Sam said, he's got that one skill and he is really, really great at shooting. Um, 
it'll be enough to get him a look and get him some time in the league. Whether his career is eh or his career is really good will depend on whether he can develop things to complement that, especially on the defensive end. I mentioned this in the first segment, but one of the things that interests me is what position he ends up playing. And I know that positions are not as in vogue today as they may have been 10 or 15 years ago in the NBA, but there, I think there's an argument for Matt Hurt as a you know, somewhat slow three where he's almost always spending time on the perimeter or he's a slightly undersized four. And, and that's where him, you know, he's, he's six, nine, maybe he's six, eight. We're not, you know, the, the, the sizes are a little murky when it comes to the college players and power forwards in the NBA nowadays, like NBA teams are, are regularly throwing two guys on the floor who are at least six ten. So Matthew hurts probably a little undersized to, to truly be a modern NBA four, but he could play up to that size, especially if he's able to get bigger. I'm curious to see when he is on an NBA roster, how he fits a- around the, the sort of other pieces that are going to be on the team with him. I think the one thing that can be the X factor for him to see more playing time in the NBA next season is his passing. Uh, Sam, you alluded to the fact that his passing is pretty decent. It's not he's he's not Magic Johnson out there, but he's going to be able to find open men. And in the NBA, if you're able to shoot, and pass, they'll work with you on the defense. I know defense will keep you on the floor, but at least the passing can always help in the offense, especially when it's trying to clear out. But just to keep this in a Duke mood, right? Think about, you you just talked about whether he's a slow three or an undersized four. You're talking about him on defensive and either guarding an RJ Barrett or a Zion Williamson. And that is something that's going to be interesting because I don't quite know how that will work. I think he could be good at both. As, as far as like from a perspective down the line, but that first year, he's going to have a nice welcome to the NBA moment when someone who is either a very athletic three or very tall four stretch four can, you know, clear him out of the lane and, and you know, do something. But I think he's going to be a guy that can improve very, very quickly as we've seen. I already made one unfair white guy to white guy comparison for Matthew Hurt when I, I mentioned how he sort of mirrors Luke Kennard's Duke career and and the way that he's kind of entering the NBA. When we talk about great shooters who are not fast and not athletic and manage to carve out long careers in the NBA, who better of a role model than JJ Redick, I think is another guy that that Matthew Hurd can look to now, very much not the same player. JJ Redick is, is six, four on a good day and, and has never had to guard a power forward in his life. But Right. Matthew Hart could, I think, could take a lot of lessons from the way that J.J. Redick has prepared and improved himself to remain in the NBA for much longer, I think, than any of us expected. So I just want to chime in really quick because we're talking about positions in the NBA. Um, the NBA will find a way to make you work no matter where if you can contribute, they'll find a way to make you work no matter where your position sort of is, because right now, one of the things that has set the league on fire is that. Zion Williamson is playing point guard. <laughs> I mean, he's it's good insane. at it too. He's yeah, <laughs> it's insane. It's crazy. But in the NBA, like that's the kind of weirdness that goes on sometimes with positions because these guys are so incredibly talented at so many different things. That's what uh, you know. That's what Matthew Hurt has to prepare for. But um, the fact that he has that skill, uh, I, I think that y- there will be teams out there. There will be a team that that tries to make him work in whatever scheme it is they're running. I, I'm not going to formally predict this, but here's a fun thing to think about. I could totally envision Matthew Hurt putting in the kind of work necessary to be great at the NBA skills challenge in like five years. Like knowing, knowing how shout. dedicated he is to his craft, he's exactly that kind of guy. Like his dribbling and his passing are like good enough to be pretty good at the college level. And if he keeps working on it, and if he's really focused on it, man, I, I think he could be really strong. Now, all of this could fall apart and he, he may not have a, a great NBA career, but I think that is all sort of up to him at this point. If, if he does not have a great NBA career, he does have the kind of skill set that will, he will make plenty of money from playing basketball, if not in the NBA, in some other league. There, there is always someone willing to pay someone to hit three pointers the way Matthew Hurt shoots the three. Especially at six and, foot nine. Yes. Right. And I was going to say like Nikola Jokic, that's a guy that he can kind of look at and kind of see how a guy who isn't really the most athletic guy, but can shoot, can stretch a team out with his three. He's very good at passing and he has become a better defender to make him one of the you know most valuable player candidates uh, for the season. 
Yeah, yeah, but, but Matthew Hurts, Matthew Hurts' jump shot is not as ugly as Nikola Jokic's jump shot, though. That's true too. Well, wait, wait, and and Nikola Jokic is three to four inches taller than Matthew Hurt, three, probably three inches taller and sixty pounds heavier. I mean, and yeah. and, and also has a magic touch. Yes, I I, I, would, I didn't I would say love he for was Matthew Hurt to be, be Nikola Jokic. I don't think he. I didn't say he was going to be Nikola Jokic. I said he should look at him to kind of craft kind of his game and take some of his pointers because again. Three years ago, we weren't talking about Nikola Jokic like we are talking about him now. So uh, I did. Before we get out of here, though, I want to wrap up the the most recent mock draft on ESPN, which was done on the eighth. So it's on ESPN Plus if you have uh, the subscription. Has Matthew Hurt going to the Bell Al Brotherhood, my Detroit Pistons, at forty eight? Of course, I would love that, but of course, there's still plenty of time for that to change. I'm going to ask both of you pick a range of five spots where you think Matthew Hurt, as of right now, gets drafted. You reserve the right to change it down the road, but right now it could be, you know, if it's 35 to 40, 15 to 20, whatever that range is. So, Sam, pick a five range. Where do you think he goes as of right now? I'll go more optimistic on Matthew Hurt. I'm looking at Sam Vecini's mock draft at The Athletic, who's got Matthew Hurt as the 39th best prospect in this draft. So I will I will take Sam Vecini's pick as the as the middle i will say that matthew hurt is going between 37 and 41 oh interesting that's almost exactly what i had i had 37 to 42 so uh i i like where you're thinking jason what do you got yeah i'm a little more pessimistic i think that nba teams really really love athleticism we see every year that guys get drafted who we're not productive college players just because they are ridiculous run jump athletes and Matthew Hurt's not going to wow anyone with his run jump ability. So I'm going to go like 43 to 48. I think that's, you know, right in the middle of the forties. I think that's where he goes. That said, I think that he will contribute more to an NBA team next year, um, next season, than plenty of the guys drafted around him and ahead of him. In, in terms of put it like this, Jason, in terms of player efficiency rating, Matthew Hurt will be in the top 30 among rookies next year. So yeah, he's, I, a, I, he's I, a I believe that too. first rounder as far as immediate impact. Yep. Yeah, I believe that too. But we we wish him all the best. It was a lot of fun to watch him in a Duke uniform, especially these past two years, uh, and especially this year, uh, when he just kind of terrorized the ACC for the majority of the season. So we cannot wait to see him on the next level. We will leave it there. For this emergency episode 307 of the DBR podcast, we will be back soon to discuss any other news that hits the streets. But for now, don't forget to listen to episode 306, our interview we did this morning with David Rubenstein. You have two episodes of Return to Glory that you can listen to right now with one coming this weekend. So stay tuned for that. And again, as Sam mentioned this morning, we have our survey that will soon uh, we will soon tabulate the results for. So tinyurl.com slash DBR podcast survey if you want to fill that out before we really start digging into the results. So for Sam and for Jason, I am Donald. Thank you for listening to this episode 307, an emergency episode. And now it is time for the Duke Band to take us home.